Hi everyone, uh, we're going to begin. Um, so thank you all for coming to this event and welcome to the second feature of the Swarthmore Project for Eastern European Relations lecture series. Um, this lecture series, titled Tomorrow's Europe, attempts to understand the social, political, and artistic developments of contemporary Eastern Europe. Three weeks ago, we heard from Andrei Kamenshikov. He is the founder of Nonviolence International and a United Nations representative for peace and conflict in Eurasia and Eastern Europe. Today, we'll be hearing from Yuri Andrukovich, one of Ukraine's prominent authors and cultural commentators. Um, just briefly about him, in 1985, Andrukovich co-founded the Buba Bu Poetic Group, which stands for Burlesque, Bluster, and Buffoonery, which shaped the cultural life of late Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine for generations. He has written seven novels, dozens of um, poetic cycles and essays, and translated several literary classics, among which are the works of William Shakespeare, Brun Schultz, Boris Pasternak, and American Poets of the Beat Generation. Andrukovich's texts are, have been translated and published into 20 languages. He is also the winner of five prestigious international literary awards. The Herder Prize, the Eric Maria Remark Prize, the Leipzig Book Prize for European Understanding, the Anglo Central European Literary Award, and the Hannah Arendt Prize for Political Thought. In 2016, he was also awarded the Goethe Medal by the German government. Please welcome Yuri Andrukovich. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'm very glad uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful for your invitation uh, to, uh, uh, to tell something about uh, my understanding what Central Eastern Europe is. And uh, it will be uh, okay. it, it, it won't be a lecture, and uh, so actually my lecturing experience is uh, practically uh, zero. So I, I would prefer just to perform uh, some of my poems or maybe some excerpts of my prose. And I'm very glad to see here so many copies of uh, my second novel. Uh, which title is uh, Moscoviat, and uh, I, mm, I think uh, it, it, it is a quite, uh, it could be a quite uh, interesting stuff uh, to read it after uh, we meet tonight. Uh, I also have some books here. It is the newest, uh, newest uh, position uh, from my bibliography, uh, the collection of uh, poems uh, called Songs for a Dead Rooster, uh, bilingual, so you can find here uh, originals in Ukrainian and English translations made by uh, two translators. One of them is Vitaly Chernetsky, who also translated this novel, Moscoviat. And uh, the second translator is uh, Ostap Kim from New York. Uh, I also have my uh, two novels so, uh, Recreations was my very first novel, uh, and uh, I think this is the last copy of uh, English version of this novel, uh, last copy which uh, I possess. And uh, my novel Twelve Circles, Dvanacet uh, Ubruci, uh, this is also Mm, translation made by Vitaly Chernetsky. And if you are interested in uh, original books in Ukrainian, I have my prose books here. The newest novel, Kohansi Ustitsi, 
uh, you can translate it into English as uh, darlings of justice. Uh, actually, they could be lovers of justice, but uh, the idea of uh, future translator of this novel, Vitaly Chernetsky, is that uh, he will use the word darlings instead of lovers. And uh, my previous prose book, Lexicon in Timnik Mist, uh, Lexicon of Intimate Cities, uh, is also in Ukrainian here. And uh, we came together uh, with uh, Mark Andrejcik, uh, who is one of translators of this book, uh, which is, uh, for me, a kind of base for this talk uh, today. Uh, the title is My Final Territory, and this is a collection of uh, my essays. Uh, actually a kind of uh, compendium what I have written uh, during last mm, 25 years let's say because uh, the the oldest essay from that book uh, has been written in uh, if I don't mistake 1993 uh, so it's actually yes. This this is a kind of uh, of my mm, way uh, through this last twenty five years, and this notion of Central Eastern Europe is uh, one of the key notions of of this book. Uh, and I will try to um, uh, to tell you something about the kind of uh, evolution of, or, or maybe development of, of this concept uh, in uh, my essayistics. So that's uh, why the title uh, I would propose. The title is uh, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, brief history of mutations. So, I'm very sorry. Uh, I uh, I will be mostly reading, not telling, but reading. Uh, but uh, this text is a kind of not not a speech, but uh, is a kind of essay too. So I would pre pre prefer to be. Uh, as close to uh, to this text as I can, and uh, I would start uh, by um, this. Uh, uh, okay, I would st start Einfa uh, easily by uh, this text because uh, I came to you from a certain part of the world where perhaps you can feel to some extent that the concept of Central Eastern Europe, despite all its fictiousness, seems to be partially related to reality. So we can suspect there is a lot of uh, fictiousness, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it, it has some, some uh, reality relationship. And I propose my understanding of this concept, moreover, that it is still very subjective. So I suggest it in my very personal subjective dimension. In addition, I want to show it as a process, that is, as, as uh, changes, uh, because each process means uh, some line of changes with layer uh, totality in their sequence. Uh, for example, uh, I ask myself, from when 
and from what uh, this began in me personally and perhaps why it began why uh, did I need and why do I still need uh, to have this uh, this tie this kind of self identification with uh, something which is actually quite fictional uh, and which is called Central Eastern Europe. And then, how has it become conceptual, become an idea, overgrown in more or less integral form? As it reached the apogee in the form of a certain geopoetic theory. How, having reached that culmination, it began to move towards gradual destruction, deterioration, and decline, and almost to a total rejection from my side. And finally, how it looks today not something that is really striving to be reborn in me, but rather something that reminds us about its very possible resuscitation. All this evolution has uh, quite possibly a purely biological basis, so I have not just jokingly used the word mutation in the title of this talk, uh, but also jokingly, of course. And now I'm going to start from the beginnings and uh, first stage of this evolution begins with my own great geographic discovery, which happened when I learned that I live near the geographical center of Europe. From the city where I was born and where I'm still living today, it is almost 100 kilometers away. And this distance, even on uh, our highways, can be overcome in one and, and one half hours. The center of Europe was found uh, in the village of Dilove, near the town of Rahiv. Uh, this is the reg uh, region of Ukraine, which is also called in Ukrainian Zakarpatia. This is Trans Transcarpathian region. Uh, as Stanislav Mucha. This is the name of a film director. Uh, he comes from Poland, but he works for some uh, mm, uh, German production studios. Uh, and he has discovered, uh, he, he, he has a very, very funny and very instructive film uh, with the German title Mitte, so the middle uh, on this subject about what center in Europe means and what it is. And uh, he has discovered uh, there are more than 70 places on the continent that are considered to be the geographical centers of Europe. So not only this one, uh, but 70. And local residents, which is interesting, local residents in all these places are very proud of the fact that they live in the heart of the continent. So I remember I also suddenly became proud of this. And somewhere in the year 1985, in the summer, I had written a poem about how how the summer diminishes, how there are less and less summer days, how the tourists 
I call them in that poem, newly washed pilgrims, flew in the direction of the Carpathian Mountains or into the Blackberry Lands. And then it ends something like uh, like this, uh, like in my in my original in that poem, it sounds like "Imandruyuch u pneni centr Evropy do vidimknutych kopalin i pecher." So and they are wandering into uh, July center of Europe toward. Uh, toward of uh, opened mines and caves. So this direction of movement, as we see, is southwest, centripetal, to the center, from the pre-Carpathian region where I live, into Transcarpathia where the center of Europe is. And behind, behind it, more to the west, um, is, for example, Hungary or Czechoslovakia. Uh, in 80s, in 1980s, it was Czechoslovakia. Uh, with, uh, for example, with a fantastic city uh, magic city, one, one of the most magic cities of this world, Prague. Uh, there was also um, another, no less valuable direction, and it was the Western Ukrainian metropoly, the city of Lviv, uh, as a kind of post-Europe. So actually, as a place that it certainly once was, and therefore, in my poems written in 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 those same 1980s, are so many texts uh, which are which are sketches from the old Lviv. The second stage began at the turn of the 80s and 90s, when I quite intensively discovered for myself the living heritage of, of the great Central Eastern European thinkers, uh, poets and dissidents, like the Poles, Czeslav Milos, Spigniew Herbert, or the Czech writer Milan Kundera or Hungarian uh, philosopher and writer George Konrad, uh, Václav Havel, uh, the Czech playwright who, uh, who then um, became a first president of uh, Free Czech Republic. And then the others, Bohumil Hrabal, Josef Krotvor, uh, Jacek Kuroń, Adam Michnik, and many, many, many others. Uh, the generation of uh, the people born, um, so between uh, two world wars, actually, we can generalize them uh, biographically. They were born in a time between two wars. And the essence of their messages formulated during the time of non-alternative domination of communist dictatorships was to remind, this is the key word, to remind the Western world, according to one of them, to Milan Kundera, about the tragedy of Central Europe. Uh, it is actually the title of uh, Kundera's uh, most important essay, The Tragedy of Central Europe. Uh, and if we use his metaphor, uh, this is a part of the continent 
which has been stolen to the east. And according to his colleague, uh, George Conrad from Hungary, uh, this is a part of Europe with very particular aesthetic vulnerability uh, of its inhabitants. So if uh, uh, you need some definition for this uh, quite fictional uh, cultural space, you, you can use this very uh, poetic and uh, very clever definition by uh, George Conrad, uh, the part of Europe with uh, particular aesthetic vulnerability of its inhabitants. And in this compendium, I personally uh, found an Ukrainian component very much to be lacking. Somebody should remind the Western world and also in the language in which uh, I write, I mean Ukrainian language, about the same thing. That Ukraine, at least in its hereditary Austro-Hungarian part, also belongs to, mm, to the Central Eastern European uh, part of the world. So if, if I find this quotation from my essay called Erz Herz Perz, and uh, I have written it in 1993, uh, yes, it's, it's here. Mm. Yeah. Our local apocalypse began not too long ago, in September of 1939, when, abandoned to the winds, upper-class homes were settled by other people. The newly arrived from far away plains were one-eyed giants with eight fingers sleeve, where they drink vodka like water, even instead of water, where they eat raw meat and dancing bears perform in churches. The easiest thing to do was to just move in to break into these secessionera villas, into the luxury of large constructivist buildings, into one-story eclectic single-family homes. The easiest thing to do was to just grab furniture, porcelain, walnut wardrobes with wrappers, toppers, pantofle and slippers, shellac records, and vinyl records, clocks, undeceivable but dangerous books with impeccable bookmarkers made of cigarette paper, oil paintings and small gypsum statues from haberdashery stores. In other words, all this culture, this whole collection of everyday stuff which the newly arrived treated with an easygoing proletarian disdain, disrespecting form, simply for what it is. But for some reason, they expressed their disdain through appropriation. But the newly arrived didn't consider that taking our dwellings also brings a certain responsibility to care for them that these walls, doors, and mansard roofs require consistent and diligent care, that unfamiliar plants in gardens and on patios need to be looked after, that rare birds should not be shot with pneumatic weapons, and that philosophers and poets should not be shot with firearms either. Uh, in another essay of the same period, 
the title is Carpatologia Cosmophilica. Uh, the symbol of this uh, part of the continent, of, uh, the symbol of Central Eastern Europe, becomes an old ruined observatory which is located high in the Carpathians. And uh, I quote uh, a little bit more from uh, that book uh, about this place, because this, this is one of my favorite places uh, ever, and uh, I discovered it for myself uh, in the second half of the 90s. I came there for the first time, and uh, it, it became one of the most symbolic uh, objects for me. This is a special relic of interwar architecture, a part of that mythical Lviv, Warsaw, Vienna, Paris vector, about which only rumors and assumptions circulate. This is a building and a structure, a dwelling, a workshop, a citadel, an academy, a library, halls for conferences, dances and gymnastics, a salon, a pool, an engine room, a restaurant, a power station, a boiler room, a line of pantries as well as a cellar and innumerable other quirky rooms with doors that are always closed. It's an arc, it's a complex. It is a complex of Europe here in its first territory at the border with non-Europe in the exact center of Europe. Summarizing my vision from that time, I would sketch it as uh, fragments or maybe splinters. I mean, uh, it was the first word which uh, came into my mind if I uh, heard or if somebody uh, said Central Eastern Europe. Then my next uh, association, next reaction was fragments or splinters or ruins. And these are, first of all, the fragments of uh, this Vienna Habsburgian world, politically destroyed by the First World War, but aesthetically existing up to the Second, Second World War, and ultimately destroyed by it more precisely by two opposing and at the same time very similar to each other regimes. Third stage came along with a gradual understanding that to complement Kundera or George Conrad and others, adding to the tragedy of Central Europe the Ukrainian version of the same uh, apocalypse is not enough. It was necessary to seek a, a new meaning for Central Eastern Europe. What this concept could have become then, at the end of the 1990s, in a sort of post-totalitarian, post-communist world. Perhaps it was about the post-political dimension. So in the year 1999, My Europe was written. This is the title of my book, written and published together with the Polish writer Andrzej Stasiuk. Each of us wrote one half of, of this book and two long essays about the strangest part of the world that is about a place you try to consider as yours. A new vision 
revision, which seemed to me a necessary one, already appeared in the title of my part, which is Central Eastern Revision. And by the way, this uh, longer essay, Central Eastern Revision, opens uh, this book, this collection. Uh, but uh, chronologically, it is a little bit, uh, mm, I would say, a, a, a little bit uh, incorrect because uh, chronologically, uh, it is the text uh, which comes from, uh, from a little bit later time as uh, the next essays published here in the book. Post-political, or better yet, the apolitical dimension of the Central Eastern Europe consists of focusing on intimate and family stories. This is a kind of synopsis of a family saga suddenly laid out in a conversation with your closest friend. This dialogue is taking place not with uh, some patriarch like uh, Milos or Kundera, but with my contemporary, with, uh, with my friend, with uh, Andrzej Stasiuk. Uh, and you drink with him, for example, some vodka, and tell him, and it turns out that you are talking not about the place, but about time. Your tools are two varieties of a time machine. Memory, as a correlation of the past, and hope, as a correlation of the future. They need to be protected from each other, because they are actually two abysses, and you are on a thin edge, and this edge is called now, between them, between past and between future. And Central Eastern Europe is becoming your only country where only your memory and only your hope make sense. Fourth stage, in the early 2000s, there were a lot of catastrophic and disturbing changes. The end of history declared by Fukuyama had come to an end. And uh, you feel here this kind of tautology. The end come to an end, but it is very eloquent. And this concerns not only September 11, 2001, at the same time we see the moment of Russia's return to its old geopolitical ambitions and what inevitably is connected with them, the shrinking and suppression of democracy within its own state body. There were already two Chechen wars in Russia, but it wasn't enough, and Russia resumed expansion on the outer territories adjacent to it. Central Eastern Europe turned out to be precisely these territories. Another interesting political process that marked the beginning of the 2000s was the enlargement of the European Union to the east. In English it was outlined by the quite capacious notion eastward enlargement. Our Western neighbors and also the Baltic countries were all preparing to become, let's call them normal Europeans, without any central or even more Eastern impurities. While Ukraine, this was an unambiguous impression, was going to be abandoned forever in the grey zone of the so-called post-Soviet space. 
I remember that quite psychologically painful moment when in October 2003 I had to get a Polish visa for the first time to visit my friend Andrzej Stasiuk. Uh, in an article devoted to that unkind change I even wrote how can it be? Brussels decides not to let me be at home for I am at home here it is not there but my Europe our Europe another Europe and it's good that it exists together with a friend of mine from the city of Chernitsi we started protecting this other Europe from the eastern and western expansions about one year earlier, somewhere between 2002 and 2003. And our form of protection was to make and publish a magazine, Central European Art Zine. It appeared on the internet and once a year as the final annual edition was printed on paper. Uh, as kind of selection of uh, most remarkable, most interesting uh, materials published uh, first in internet. And it was called Potiach 76, Train 76. And it was indeed a train in all its meanings. Like its railway prototype, it united not only Chernitsi with the Polish city of Przemysl or Warsaw with Bucharest and Gdańsk with Varna. It tried to create something like united and unique, at the same time united and unique cultural space of, of the new Central Eastern Europe. Well, okay, not to create, but to guess it and test it, registering and fixing in it certain cultural and artistic manifestations, uh, which used to be, um, so to speak, on, on the top of the tendencies and trends, and uh, which uh, seemed to be uh, more essential in that time. Why the new Central Eastern Europe? Because I updated my understanding of what it is. The space between Estonia, if you can imagine, and Albania, which has been united by post-totalitarian reality. That is why not just Estonia and Albania which were already mentioned, should be included in my Central Eastern Europe, but also Latvia and Lithuania, and then Moldova, Bulgaria, Serbia, with Montenegro, Croatia and Macedonia. I didn't mention either Poland or the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Slovenia, whose place in that particular space was more than obvious to me, but I mentioned the seas, three of them, the Baltic, the Black and the Adriatic seas. In another essay from that time I came to a definition such as this, my Central Eastern Europe is actually the former socialist camp, the Eastern Bloc, the regions whose population felt the division of the world following the Second World War to be largely unsatisfactory and offensive. And their direct descendants, therefore, supported a subsequent, in their opinion, more e equitable division. I could not help but worry about this new division. 
for Ukraine, which seemed to be abandoned and left beyond the democratic Western world, it meant a break with all European aspirations. They are burial. It has not happened yet, thanks to a miracle. This miracle has a very specific name and a very vivid color. It was called the Orange Revolution, which, as I will write somewhat later on, has become an unexpected resuscitation of the whole ethical and ideological array, which is traditionally called European values. In other words, the victory, albeit very embarrassing and short-lived one, of the Ukrainian revolution at the end of 2004 has become, in fact, the victory of Europe itself, with a little help of Ukrainian people. In that very historic moment, geopolitics of the great orange carnival in the center of Kyiv had overcome geopolitics. So it was like a conflict between geopoetics and geopolitics. In those days, the same friend of mine, the Polish author Andrzej Stasiuk, published an inspirational article with a very eloquent title, Europe, you became bigger. Fifth stage, however, it turned out soon that Europe, on its Brussels bureaucratic level, didn't want to become bigger. The, the reaction of officials to the orange breakthrough of Ukrainian society turned out to be more than cool and restrained. This restraint, to a high extent, enabled the revenge of anti-European political forces in Ukraine. At the same time, there was a gradual repression of the Central Eastern Europe from the new European Union countries. And I commented in 2005 that it is a gentle but consistent and steady repression which leaves no place for Central Eastern Europe. The ambiguity, the existence in between, disappears on all levels from the unification of the landscape to the pragmatization of the mentalities. But the consciousness and therefore the being between the being between the East and the West is central to Central Eastern European self-awareness. And the understanding of being in between is a kind of recognition, a kind of distinctive sign. The Czech Republic, or let's say Poland, formally are no more countries in between. They have been invited to become part of the West and they are diligently working on that. Instead, today's Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova are countries in between. And Ukraine, in the most perceptible way of all these three countries, in the 14th year of its rather formal independence, it finally made itself independent from Russia but received neither an invitation from the West nor the promise of an invitation. Based on this, I, in the same essay, by the way, its title is Atlas Meditations, formulated another vision of the Central Eastern Europe now as a moving space. Central Eastern Europe has moved 
and is drifting eastward across Ukrainian territory. The resistance of the East will be inevitable and even if it is an exaggeration to call it war, it is at any rate a grueling conflict. However, Ukraine didn't withstand this very critical test. First of all, in the sense of a social political choice. Somewhere starting in 2006, there is a growing sense that the Central Eastern Europe in Ukraine is shrinking in a more and more dramatic way and uh, that everything is heading towards a huge social catastrophe. I mentioned the anti-European revenge. In 2010, it became final and complete. The Central Eastern Europe had also been closed down as a process. In particular, its drift in the eastern direction. To the west of us, this process was understood and sympathized with less and less. To the east was Russia, and it, not even gradually, but quite decisively and like a predator sharply, had taken full control over the ruling elite in Kyiv, which in the same way tried to take control over each of us and the whole country. For me personally, it meant another wave of pessimism that was bordering with despair, as if it was a confirmation of an old and not quite serious thesis about Ukraine that is such a large territory that it simply is not able to fit in any Europe. Especially into the absolutely ephemeral at that very time Central Eastern Europe. There wasn't any further sense to think about this ephemery to develop them to change one's vision and to experience new mutations together with them. It seemed to me that it was time to put a massive fork in that concept. But there is always life after death or post stage. Euro Maidan, in other words, the revolution of dignity ended by death, symbolically marked the beginning of our country's existence in a new way. The previous drama with elements of vaudeville or even farce had reached the level of tragedy. I really want to hope it is an optimistic one. The jokes are over demons, or if you prefer angels, are released on a free flight. The aggression of Russia in all its varieties, like economic pressure, mass culture, backstage diplomacy, propaganda, including military aggression, left us no choice but the European one. The reverse side of this conclusion Ukraine's European choice didn't leave Russia any other option but aggression. What came into reality has to be called a moment of truth. The European choice is no longer a matter of aesthetic or even social political orientation. It is a matter of life and death. More precisely, a question of life and not death. In April of last year, we were discussing with friends about the newest eastern borders of Europe. And this meant automatically about its center too, because it is known that the center of Europe is exactly where the borders of non-Europe are. 
in the verbal combination Central Eastern. The Eastern refers to the geographical location and the Central to importance, meaning, tendency to the future. And our public discussion took place in one of the most eastern cities of free Ukraine, in Kharkiv, more precisely in the largest, it is called the big chemical auditorium of Kharkiv University, crowded that evening by hundreds of listeners, and due to the coincidence of events on that very day, the European Parliament voted for visa-free regime for Ukrainian citizens. This news brought significantly more drive and even euphoria into the already turbulent atmosphere of the big chemical hall. It was like chemistry itself a very special chemistry mixing ideas and emotions. The center of Europe that evening was definitely there. I dare to risk by assumption that the Central Eastern Europe today is about all, let's say, this city, Kharkiv. Already it is not Lviv with which Everything is clear because it already is like Brussels. But for example, Kharkiv, especially after a Kharkiv poet, the organizer of the meeting, stated that the eastern boundary of Europe today can be determined quite easily and completely coincides with the line of the Eastern Ukrainian Front, or as it is called officially, by the line of delimitation. And the audience applauded his words for a long time. And uh, at that moment, I thought, okay, this Central Eastern Europe is not dead, it is still alive. And uh, it is probably the beginning of some uh, new evolution and new development in this part of the world. So that's. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we're going to open it up to a few questions um, for around five to ten minutes. Um, I would love to start. Um, thanks for speaking. Um, so, what do you think is the the next step in actualizing the central eastern definition that Ukraine is attempting to take on as it is moving closer and closer to the west? Uh, I would say there is there is a, a quite uh, clear uh, social political. Uh, perspective not just for Ukraine but uh, for the rest of uh, this uh, post-Soviet republics uh, I, I mean uh, they, they have different uh, different points of uh, political being you know, for political life but uh, the tendency is the same, and we, we can see it on, on, uh, in the case of uh, Belarus, for example, where uh, this uh, president who is uh, mm, uh, like a last uh, dictator in Europe, but he is uh, striving to uh, somehow to, to, to use uh, some pro-European uh, rhetorics too, uh, which wasn't a, a case uh, some ten years ago. Uh, so this is actually the, the common process, uh, but uh, there are some completely new uh, manifestations in the countries which are mm, our Western neighbors, uh, 
which I have mentioned here many times, like uh, classical Central Eastern European countries like Poland or uh, Hungary or Czech Republics. And uh, they uh, demonstrate through their governments today uh, absolutely different tendencies. They built some uh, other project of Central Eastern Europe which uh, could be uh, directed against uh, European Union as such. They, they, they uh, are striving to create some uh, alternative to Brussels, let's say. So it uh, wasn't uh, expected. Uh, I never thought uh, they can, uh, our Western neighbors, they can be back uh, to this phraseology and to these ideas to be a part of something of Central Eastern, or they say of Central Europe. And uh, we don't have uh, mm, some uh, timetable or schedule of uh, Ukrainian integration. We uh, are in a very uh, complicated uh, situation now uh, because of uh, this uh, local today's uh, political struggle uh, connected to, uh, uh, to the elections in the next year. So there is there is no place for some strategy, <laughs> I would say. I'm sorry to say that about this, but uh, mm, we have to wait and to observe the situation uh, now uh, a little longer. I, I think uh, a few years uh, and after this next uh, cycle of elections, uh, we can do some conclusions, but uh, they uh, won't be uh, absolutely uh, clear and uh, absolutely uh, uh, unambiguous. Um, so you're both a poet and an essayist. How do you um, use poetry as a political tool, and how do you think that's different from your um, prose writing? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an answer because, you know, uh, I used to be a poet. <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, the, the story in, in two parts, I would say. Um, I was a poet in 1980s, and then I have written and uh, I have published uh, uh, the, the three books of poetry, and uh, it was somehow uh, uh, it had an end in 1990. Uh, afterward, there was a long break, nine years, or ten, ten nine, in, uh, at the end of 90s, I um, started writing poetry again, and then I published the next uh, uh, poetry book in 2004, and uh, so it was like a uh, different line Mm, of my writings then, because it was the, this second period, it was the time uh, I was writing also novels and uh, essays. But I always uh, tried to, uh, not, not to separate it, but uh, somehow to, um, to consider uh, some uh, political thinking and, and uh, political feeling uh, as a part of of uh, bigger writers' project, so it's uh, not an um, approach of uh, politician. It is uh, approach of uh, let's say of a poet, just. Thank you. 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 Thank you
to support who um, is uh, of course very um, doubtful as a political person but who has a right to uh, to observe and to formulate some ideas for the politicians too. With the concept of Ukraine as part of Central, as Central European, um, it feels like there's a, a desire to have some self-determinacy in the midst of being trapped between the European Union and Russia. And my read of the situation is that Ukraine is a buffer zone between the European Union and Russia, and that the European Union can't, can't let Ukraine do what it wants to do because it can't make Russia unhappy, do, is that, is that the way that Ukrainians think of things, or? Um, yes, we, uh, we in Ukraine uh, have uh, some regular uh, discussion about uh, our uh, European way, about this uh, uh, we, we call it uh, integration, but uh, I, I would call it a, a little bit more careful uh, about the, the way toward uh, Europe. But we always have uh, the new uh, uh, new sociological uh, tests. Uh, what the people think about this and uh, how do they imagine uh, their future. And it is always the majority of society who answers uh, positive, answers yes for European future since, as I remember, since the beginning of 2000s. Uh, maybe since 2002 or 2003, we always have more than 50% who are for European future. Uh, sometimes it is like uh, more than 70%, but uh, it varies and uh, there are different moments too. But in the moments of uh, deepest disappointment by Europe and European uh, restraint in that uh, Ukrainian case, even in, in, in those moments, uh, we have a majority. Uh, we have uh, normally more than 50% who support this idea Ukraine should be a part of some united European body or organism. And I think this is uh, enough. Uh, to be uh, to be consequent and to, to be let's say to, to, to be strong and to be insisting and uh, European politicians uh, they they are on the way they are on the road too they are not uh, on some final point of decision uh, from from the very very simple uh, reason they uh, have to learn something and they uh, are changed all the time so there are new tendencies uh, always uh, mm, so I, I, I don't see some mm, final point of, of uh, this situation uh, of course, uh, we, we can uh, consider it in uh, categories of uh, some triangle, and then we have to mention uh, Russia as a very active and strong factor, and this is uh, 
for me this is a story uh, which has no end in the, in the triangle. It's uh, with uh, three open ends. Um, how does this new sense of direction maybe manifest in contemporary Ukrainian literature or affect the literature today? Uh, that's a good question. That's a very good question for some uh, big uh, study, maybe a, a monography or uh, some bigger book. No, I mm, uh, I see it uh, as uh, mm, completely uh, new mm, quality of uh, Ukrainian literary texts, uh, uh, which are written by different, very different authors. But if we speak about the, the youngest among them, between, uh, if we speak about the, the generations of uh, the authors who are today, let's say, uh, 25 years old uh, and uh, a little bit elder, Mm, they are actually uh, they are inside they are in a context of what the European authors you know write and they, they have the very good uh, experience being there they, they have the contacts they they are published in uh, different uh, European uh, uh, magazines and uh, publishing houses and uh, uh, I think they are uh, they, they don't think how to be uh, a part of this European literature today they, they just are a part of it uh, the problem, the big problem is that if they write uh, their works in Ukrainian and they are majority who write uh, in Ukrainian uh, the biggest problem is a lack of uh, translators, uh, the lack of uh, mm, uh, literary talented native speakers in different European countries who can translate uh, directly from Ukrainian. And this is a huge problem because uh, in such languages as, uh, as uh, let's say, French or German or English, there are some, uh, sometimes there are five or six people who can do it, who can translate. But if we speak about such languages like uh, Swedish or Dutch or, let's say, uh, even Italian or Spanish, there is a huge lack. The, the publishers who are interested by newest Ukrainian literature, uh, they decide to publish some novel or some novels, and then they realize the fact they cannot find somebody who can translate it into uh, Spanish, let's say, or Swedish. And uh, so they practice now uh, such things which are not uh, really uh, uh, allowed in literary process. I mean, uh, they use some translations uh, into other languages uh, and they use translations made not from originals but translation of translation. And uh, so this is the problem. But uh, I hope uh, we uh, we can establish in uh, in our country in Ukraine we can establish some uh, system of uh, donations of uh, some system of institutions uh, which can help in the, in that case. So if 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 they uh, uh, let's say if if they organize some kind of grants or stipends in Ukraine for foreigners 
who want to come into country and to live there for months, for years, uh, learning language, the context, uh, mentality, and uh, so it, it should be a big uh, project and uh, I, I always suggest uh, where I can um, to the people who could do something in that direction uh, that such program devoted to the future translators of our literature uh, would be one of the, the best initiatives and uh, it, it could be very, very useful for us.